Welcome, New Beginning Baptist Church, and those watching. We are back to our series, Encounters with the Risen Jesus. But first, I just want to say I hope you had a great 4th of July. I'm really thankful to be an American. I'm thankful for the American values that all men are created equal, that uh, every right to every human should be life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And uh, though America has its faults and has through history, the whole world is guilty before God. And I'm thankful for what God's done in America and for those who were founding fathers who saw the value of those truths, which are biblical, those are biblical truths, and established our nation upon those so that as a nation, at least we can be a light in the world and we can, we can fix our own problems when we don't follow that. So I'm, I'm thankful for being an American. I, I trust that you are as well, hope that you are as well, and that you had a wonderful 4th of July. And let's be continuing to pray for our nation um, that, uh, you know, we have wisdom, we see things biblically, and uh, that we are, are, are doing our part. And that's what, that's what today's message is about. It's about Jesus' great commission to us as Christians in the church. And so this is, this, we're talking about the solution today, so this is pretty big stuff. Um, the last encounter we spoke about uh, when we were back in the series was Jesus' appearance in Galilee to over 500 brethren at once. Today, we'll be looking at Jesus' appearance on a mountain in Galilee where Jesus preached what is commonly called the Great Commission. Now, it is very possible that the appearance to the over 500 brethren at once and this appearance that we're looking at today recorded in Matthew 28, 16 through 20, are actually one in the same. So Matthew might actually, even though he didn't really talk about the numbers, he just mentioned the 11 disciples, this actually might be what Jesus preached to all of them. This might be where it happened on this mountain. Um, so regardless, this appearance with the Great Commission did occur in Galilee. And like I said, it's extremely important for us as Christians in the church to understand it and to obey it especially for the sake of our world and our nation. So let's get right to the text. Go ahead and go to verse 16 of Matthew 28. It says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. Verse 17, And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So I want to take a quick look at these verses first to give some food for thought. Matthew 28, 16 says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. First, Matthew lists them as the eleven disciples. So, the twelve without Judas Iscariot, of course. He also calls them disciples rather than apostles. Because up to this event, they were not yet considered apostles. Now, at the time Matthew wrote, this gospel, they were called apostles by that time. And there were at least 12 by that time as well, because one got picked to replace, and then you also have Paul. Um, but he's not writing from the perspective of the time period he wrote it, looking back. No, he's trying to put us into the time period when it happened. So they were just the 11 disciples at that point. Um, so he's talking from that perspective as a writer, and it says that they went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. So not only is this in Galilee, um, where he met the seven who were fishing, where he visited those who were over the 500 at one time, and that's where the time period would fit, but not just in Galilee, but actually in a specific mountain in Galilee. And not just a mountain in Galilee, a mountain that Jesus had appointed the disciples to meet him then. So if this is where the 500 were, then this would be a correction to what I said about the appearance of the 500 prior. The disciples would be expecting Jesus to come. I had mentioned that maybe they gathered the 500 together to tell them how they had seen the risen Jesus and Jesus actually showed up. Well, if this was where it happened, then they would have actually been telling people, hey, gather here together. We've seen the risen Jesus and he's coming at this at this time, at this place, so gather together. And that makes a lot of sense. 
It's very likely that he set up this appointment when he was with the seven disciples at the Sea of Galilee. Remember, he told Peter, feed my sheep, right? And he would have told these other disciples, hey, I don't have a life of just fishing for you, uh, you know, fishing for fish. You know, remember what I called you to be, fishers of men. And I also want you, we already have some disciples, and I want you to feed them. I want you to lead them. Um, so it would make sense. Jesus gives them this, this assignment, you know, come uh, gather the, the, these disciples in Galilee, throughout Galilee that I've healed, that I've taught, that are already following me, that don't know I've risen. Go gather them so that I can meet them in this mountain. It, it would just make sense. It, it pieces together really well. Um, so anyhow, we don't know for sure again, um, but I also have another clue that I that I can see in this passage. So let's look at that. It says the next next verse, you know, it does give us a good reason to believe that there are more who had uh, that were at that meeting who had not yet seen Jesus risen from the dead. Verse seventeen it says, and when they saw him, they worshipped him. That makes that makes perfect sense if it was just the eleven. Also, I mean, you know, um, but it doesn't stop there. It says, but some doubted. That some doubted really to me is kind of a clue i can't i can't really imagine that any of the 11 disciples or any of the other disciples who had already encountered the risen jesus at this point would have any doubts i it just doesn't make any sense for them to have any doubts at this point so it seems natural that you know there's people here who hadn't yet seen jesus risen from the dead like this is the first time right and then in and they're in a big crowd, so, you know, they're really trying to say, hey, is this legitimate here? Uh, so they have some doubts. You know, um, now, Matthew just tells us Jesus teaching the Great Commission. However, if this group group was the group of over 500 at, at once, I imagine that Jesus took time to show them how his coming and death and resurrection were actually fulfillment of the scriptures. Remember, that's what he did with the two on the road to Emmaus, as well as the 11 disciples, in the, or the 10 disciples without Thomas in, the, in that room um, where they're waiting. Um, so, you know, and if they had doubts, he would probably do that. Here, I think it's plain that this great commission that, the four, you know, those, those verses that Matthew records here of Jesus' teaching is essentially the conclusion of, or the highlight of Jesus' sermon, not the totality of it, um, which which makes sense. You know, you wouldn't expect somebody writing about an event to have to give every single word for word the entire length of a sermon. You know, they might just have a certain part of it that they want to bring out. It's also interesting to me how they would have worshipped Jesus. I mean, think about it, right? Uh, what did they What did they do to worship Jesus? You know, uh, was there a song that they could sing? You know, uh, I don't imagine they had any songs written yet with the name Jesus. But you know what? They had a lot of psalms and hymns that they were already singing. There were messianic psalms, messianic hymns, singing about the Savior. And uh, that's who Jesus is. So I imagine they sing those songs toward him, believing that he is, he is indeed that, the one who is the Lamb of God who was slain uh, for our sins and then rose from the dead who's going to come back and set up his kingdom one day, you know? So, uh, and at this point, they don't know, maybe he's going to set up his kingdom soon. You know, they haven't heard him tell, say that, that he's not going to do that. So, uh, one more thought, then we'll get to the actual Great Commission. In my mind, for years, without doing it on purpose, just, I guess, just not noticing or paying attention, I, I've kind of seen um, this giving of the Great Commission in Matthew 20 as the same uh, in Mark 16 and as the same in Acts chapter 1 like there was only one time that Jesus gave the Great Commission and they must all be the same uh, like they're parallel passages with just the writers mentioning different parts of it um, but for sure that's that can't be the case um, this appearance uh, with the Great Commission here in Matthew 28 cannot possibly be the same one that we read about in Acts chapter 1 um, the most obvious reason for that is that they occur in two totally different locations. Matthew 28, where we are today, occurs in a mountain in Galilee. Acts chapter 1, where Jesus ascends, he's actually ascending here, occurs in Mount Olivet, outside of Jerusalem, 
two totally different locations. As far as Mark chapter 16, it's really not detailed enough to know whether it occurred in Galilee here and is parallel with Matthew 28, or maybe it's in Mount Olivet in Acts chapter 1. Maybe it's a different meeting altogether. Mark's style of writing is to kind of run through the highlights, so he's pretty good for giving the sequence of events, but maybe not so much at specifying when there might be gaps of time between those events. He doesn't really take the time to do that. So a little food for thought. Now let's move to the content of the Great Commission here in Matthew 28, verse 18. It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So Matthew 18, again, uh, 28, 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So as the one who conquered death, Jesus most certainly backs up this statement that he has all power in heaven and earth. It means that he has total freedom and he has total authority in heaven and earth. So nothing has authority or power over him to keep him from doing his will. That's the freedom, right? And he has authority and power over all that he wills to exercise over. So this most certainly speaks of his divinity, that he's deity, that he is Lord God. Uh, and we'll see a little bit later, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We know that they have a different relationship within the Godhead, those three persons of the one God, one God in being, three in person, and how they interact in the Father, and basically the structures of fathers over the Son, and then they're over the Spirit. Um, we kind of see that playing out in Scripture. But Scripture tells us elsewhere that when God... As the Son in Philippians chapter 2 fashioned himself as a human, that he was humbling himself, not only limiting his abilities within human flesh, but that he also came to die a shameful death in our place, bearing our sins. He laid down his power to live for three days. And when he resurrected, he took back his power over life and over death and over the limitations of humanity that he had placed upon himself prior. So as God the Son resurrected, he once more had all power in heaven and earth and in his proper relation to the Father and the Spirit. He then says, Go ye therefore. So on the basis of his authority as God the Son, he gives us these commands. The first of which is go ye. Ye, when you see it in the King James Version, it's plural for the word you. Um, the is singular. Ye is plural. So he's speaking to all of us who are his disciples to do it collectively. What's amazing, uh, which, which by the way, the, the, is, that's what the church is, right? And the local church is a local body of believers collectively on the mission that God's given us, that Jesus gives us here. What's amazing, that though he has all power, he does not make us go. He commands us to go. Would he have every right to control our brains and our bodies like robots so that we do what he wants us to do? Sure. But even with all this authority that he has, infinite power, he gives us a command that we are to choose to follow. He, he doesn't make us. He commands us and allows us to choose. Now, there's a right and a wrong choice. Uh, it would be the wrong choice to not obey it, right? To choose not to follow the command is actually a disregard of the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. But his authority is also, is also what gives value for the rest of his command. So let's take a look at that aspect. It's not only the, you know, uh, a basis for it, but it also gives the Great Commission great value, okay? Uh, verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. 
What good is it to teach Jesus? What good is it to baptize in his name as well as God the Father and God the Spirit? What good is it to teach the ways of Jesus that he has commanded us to live by? How does any of that have value? All of it has value because of who Jesus is. Because he is Lord of all. If he wasn't Lord of all, none of that would really have value. But he does. He has all power over heaven and earth. What great value. There's nothing you can commit your life to that is more worthy than fulfilling the great commission for the sake of the one who has all power in heaven and earth. While mankind struggles ultimately with its sinfulness and the curse of sin it brings upon itself and, and the way that we, we destroy one another, whether it's war, but, but then the curse of sin, which brings natural disasters and, and disease and pandemics, right? Or, or whether it's, it's that sinfulness within man, that greed for power, um, that fights against our desire to have freedom and equality, right? Which are biblical values. Or, you know, you have some that will lie and kill to gain dominance. They may even lie. I see this going on now. They lie about how they care about uh, people's equality in their lives. But it's not the case. They're just using them to gain power. And it can be clearly seen, if we're paying attention as Christians, what's happening today, we can see there's a couple groups that are doing that. They have totally different agendas than what they say they do. Um, because they're hypocritical. You can see it, the hypocrisy. In one case they care, and care. in one case they don't. It's, it's absurd. So while we see nations rise and fall, uh, while mankind grasps, to live forever and escape death uh, or deny it, right? Um, while all that's happening, Jesus and Jesus alone is the only man in all past, present, and future who has put under his feet all sin and all evil and all the curse of sin, and has overcome death and hell, and has secured victory and eternal life through his righteousness. Not for himself, but for all of humanity who will repent and receive him by grace through faith. This is the greatest commission, my friends, because there is nothing else that pales in comparison to the greatness of the one who gave the commission or the one who is the object of the commission, Jesus Christ, the Lord, the Son of God, God who became flesh to save us from ourselves and from our sin and to reconcile us to God and to give us eternal life and to one day set up a kingdom that's going to be just. It's going to have equality for all. It's going to do right. It's going to be full of righteousness. There will be no sin, no curse, I mean, it's going to be amazing. Jesus is the answer to all of it. When we go, when we are intentional lights for Jesus, when we teach who Jesus is and what he's done, that's the good news of Jesus, that's the gospel. When we help people to commit to follow Jesus by baptizing them, adding them to the church, which is God's community, listen, that's God's organization. That's God's movement. That's where we should invest in. It, if the church of God is not right with God, there's no hope for this world. Time's up. But when the church of God is humble and seeks his face and turns from their wicked ways and calls out to heaven in prayer, look, that's when God brings healing. That's when God works. That's when God moves. That's where, that's where we should commit to. That's where we should put our faith in into Christ, who's the head of the church. And we should be leading the church to do what's right in the world and to fulfill this great commission. So it says, when the church, listen, when the church obeys and the disciples of Jesus help each other to be and to live the way Jesus commands us to be and to live, then we will see God bring life. Life that is spiritually rich and meaningful. Life that is eternal. Life that can't be taken away, even at the hands of unjust men. Then we will see true freedom and equality grow. 
and become a reality in our society. Then we will see families the way God intended them to be, strong where, and, and proper, where there's a, a, a man and a woman who are husband and wife, a father and mother to children who they raise in the nurture and admonition of the Lord rather than ra being raised by the lust and the lies of the world. There's no, this is no small task. In reality, it's the biggest task mankind could ever undertake. This is no easy task either. Rather, it is the most difficult task of all that's ever been asked of any human being or group of human beings. One that we don't have the ability in and of ourselves to accomplish. But the one who has all power in heaven and earth, uh, com who commands this, gives us a promise to those who go to obey it. And here's the promise. Here's what makes it worthwhile to do. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen? Amen. Because Jesus is with us. Because he has all power. Because he is worthy, my friends. We are to go. And we are to teach the gospel. And we are to grow the church. And we are to be the church. And we are to... It, live like the church should live and teach others how to follow the truths of God's word as well. Look, there's no limitation of time or space in which Jesus will not be with you. He will be with you always. That Greek word, that phrase, unto the end of the world, can also be translated unto the end of the age. One in the same. It's eternal and it's infinite. Throughout the world, throughout time, He will be with us. That's the promise He has when we obey the Great Commission. So let us go and teach the gospel. Let us baptize. Let us disciple, knowing that Jesus and His power go with us through the Holy Spirit. And let us know that this is what the world needs. Let's not be entangled with the corruption and the movements in this world so often that present themselves as one thing, but they're completely not. Let's commit ourselves to God's mission. Commit ourselves to God's community, the church, as they obey Him. Let's commit to His movement. Let's commit to His great commission for yourself, for your family, for your neighborhood, for your city, for your state, for your nation, for your world. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. May God's grace and peace be with you as we serve the Lord Jesus Christ together.